Okay. The atmosphere. Okay, hold on. Okay, Jason, thank you for those <clears throat> kind words. Jason123, he just said something beautiful. He said, man, I love you, Sam. You helped me fall in love with Christ. That's my goal. I hope, I hope by the power of the Holy Spirit, by the blood of Jesus, that the Lord Jesus will use me by his spirit to lead people to fall more passionate in love with Jesus Christ and that I can be more in love with Jesus and just adore Jesus Christ. So thank you. That's the goal of every teacher. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jason, for those kind words, because in these last few days, I've had some Protestant brothers and sisters <clears throat> really upset and shocked at the series I did on the communion of saints. <clears throat> and I just want to make it clear. I honestly don't want to be unnecessarily offensive, but I don't want to tickle ears. And my prayer has always been, and I pray my prayer will continue to be, that the Holy Spirit of the living God will sanctify me to understand the scriptures perfectly and accept whatever the Bible teaches and live it out for the glory of Jesus. That's why I said I've come to this position. <clears throat> I didn't come to this position because of, and I'm, again, I want to be careful what I say. I'm not saying tradition is bad in of itself. There's bad tradition and good tradition. But I didn't come to this because of tradition. I came to this because of the scriptures. I love the Bible. I have no doubt the Bible is the perfect preserved word of God for the church of Jesus Christ preserved by the Spirit, <clears throat> and I hope to understand the Bible perfectly and live it out perfectly for the glory of Jesus. So that's why if you can convince me scripturally, I'll accept, right? So I just want to thank you, Jason. I pray that will be my motive in life, use of the Spirit, so I can fall more in love with Jesus and help others fall in love with Jesus. And that's the work of the Holy Spirit. Yes, and I'm a Trinitarian because the Bible forces me to be the Trinity. And I pray the Holy Spirit will cause me to be in love with the Trinity and die for the Trinity, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Right? We're going to wait a few more minutes. We're waiting for a few more faces. We're going to talk about <clears throat> salvation according to Luke and Acts in response to a form of dispensationalism that teaches that the message of salvation for the Jews before the conversion of Paul was different from the message of salvation revealed to Paul for the Gentiles. So Lord Jesus willing, we'll discuss that, and I'll begin in prayer. But I will address one passage that was used against me to try to show that my belief in the biblical basis for the communion saints is a violation of Deuteronomy 18, verses 9 to 14. We'll talk about that. But in the meantime, if you guys have a question, yes, it is, Ephesians 4, 7, 10, and I'll read all the way to 16. I'll try to entertain a question. That doesn't entail a lengthy response. No, actually, it doesn't. It, no, it does. Revelation doesn't teach that. If, if you want proof of it, just read Revelation 7, verses 9 to 17. The great multitude of human beings <clears throat> that could not be numbered from every language, tribe, and tongue. They were standing before God, not because of their works, but because of the blood of the Lamb, that made them pure, righteous, and worthy enough to stand before God. That's Revelation 7, 9 to 17, which is also then confirmed, Stephen, in Revelation chapter 5, verses 9 to 10. We have been made a kingdom of priests serving God because of the blood of the Lamb. That's not to say that once you're born of the Spirit and powered by the Spirit and walking in the Spirit, that you won't do good works. You must do good works because that's the necessary fruit of being transformed and saved and united to Christ. Now, Pablo, remember I said, now I'm going to have Catholics, Orthodox disagree with me, but again, remember I said that I still affirm sola scriptura, sola fide. So because of that, I'm convinced that the Bible teaches that you're saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, apart from any righteous deeds that you do. You with me there? Until I'm convinced, scripturally, exegetically, that's not what the Bible teaches, I am Sola Scriptura, Sola Fide. And God willing, in the near future, we'll talk about why I am. And if I'm wrong, I know the Holy Spirit will give me the grace to admit I'm wrong and change. But if I'm right, I know the Holy Spirit will strengthen me. Strengthen me in believing that these doctrines are truly revelations from God. 
So I'm not going to please everyone, and I don't want to please everyone. I want to please God and be honest with Scripture. As long as people understand that they can agree to disagree with me without condemning me, right? By the way, I told you I was going to trim my beard. Lord willing, I am going to do a touch-up job because I'm heading out, Lord Jesus willing, I'm heading out to L.A. from August 28th to September 15th. I'm going to go to a convention where I'm going to see some of my Assyrian friends and family. But also I'm going to be doing pre-recorded shows by the grace of God for satellite television exposing Islam. About 26 episodes. So pray for a powerful, spirit-filled anointing. And while I'm on, while I'm there, if you guys want to meet me, if you're in LA, contact me and I'll meet you. We'll meet for coffee. If you even if you want me to come to your church or Bible study, use me there for the glory of Jesus Christ. I'll have a lot of time. So again, I'm making the invitation. If you want me to come and just meet one on one, contact me. If you want me to come to your church or Bible study or home group, contact me. I'll be there from August 28th, God willing, till September 15th, Lord willing. Serving Jesus. Right? I was in Florida, 316. I debated that oneness heretic in Florida. Amen, ter terrestrial fan. Hallelujah. Yahweh Father, Son, Spirit. Yahweh Father, Son, Spirit. Yahweh Father, Son, Spirit. I'm still waiting for Orbiter to show up. He posts verses, but we'll wait a few more minutes. We're going to discuss, okay? I'm just waiting for the regular show up. Hopefully one day I'll get a 1,000 like David Wood. I'm hating on him. Apply my heart to do your will, O God, as from the Psalms. Amen, amen. Any questions that won't entail a lengthy answer so I can get into the meat of the matter? I want to discuss. <clears throat> Does... The New Testament teach that Jesus' apostles preached a different message of salvation to the Jews from that revealed to the Apostle Paul. Because Pablo asked me, and I want to address it. C Cabello, are you a man saying beard is beautiful? Well, my beard is really thin. I mean, I'm not going to get rid of it. You know, David Wood addressed it last night when Anthony Rogers was debating that heretic. Anthony Rogers' connection was really bad. It kept buff buffering. And David Wood explained that the reason why, it's because that usually happens on Friday. For some reason, Friday, there's so many people using YouTube that the connection is very bad. I will be, Zena. I'll be doing a series of skits as Halal Hogan and other characters for David Wood. But Zena, I'm, I'm waiting for Hollywood to discover me because I want to become an actor so I can make enough money to do full-time ministry, right? Who knows? Let's see. Yeah. yeah let's roll down. Sorry. Joel, how you doing, buddy? Can you talk about the mark of the beast? Yeah, don't take it. Choose Jesus. Don't take it. Don't mark yourself with the mark of the beast. <laughs> Hold on. I know we belong here. You can't start without a good cup of coffee. Okay. All right, folks, let me begin in a word of prayer. And then <clears throat> I may have to just bring up the verses myself until Orbiter shows up. And first and last is not around. I pray they show up. Okay. <clears throat> we love you, Father. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. Father, you are worthy of all praise of all love and devotion and adoration. You alone are God, the true God, in union with your Son, the Lord Jesus, and your Holy Spirit. Father, you're worthy of praise for who you are, not only because of what you've done. Your Son is worthy of praise. Your Spirit is worthy of praise. And we love you. We love the Lord Jesus. We love the Holy Spirit. Father, use me again tonight. Father, please have mercy with us. Have mercy with me in my impatience. Father, please deliver me from my impatience and unrighteous anger, so I don't be a stumbling block and unnecessarily offensive and grieve your spirit. Crucify our flesh, destroy our flesh, remove the stain of our flesh and the fruit of our flesh, and fill us with fruit from your spirit, life from your spirit, power from your spirit, wisdom, understanding, and knowledge from your spirit, and love from your spirit, to be in love with you, in love with Jesus, in love with the spirit. And Father, anoint 
my thoughts and my words to speak truth without error, to speak it clearly without confusion and stammering, Father. And bless your people, Father. Fill them with wisdom and knowledge and passion from your spirit to fall more passion in love with Jesus Christ. And bless our loved ones, Father. Be with my daughters, Father. You know the tragedy that them and I have undergone. Save them from this broken marriage. Convict their mother to repent. Save me to be Jesus through this and to be a godly example for their eyes and cover them with the blood of Jesus and provide for them, provide for our families, provide for everyone here, whether broken families or diseases, cover them, cover us with the blood of Jesus and fill us with the spirit. And Father, fill my lungs and my chest and throat with the health I need from your spirit to do this. And anoint the sound of my voice to be pleasing to the ears of your servants, Father. They're not here for me. They're here for you, Father. And please use me for your glory. You don't need me. I need you. We need you. We need the Lord Jesus. We love you, Lord Jesus. We need the Holy Spirit. We love you, Holy Spirit. Save us from attacks of the enemy in Jesus' name. Amen. Yahweh, Father, Son, Spirit. Yahweh, Father, Son, Spirit. Yahweh, Father, Son, Spirit. Keep praying. I can get my health. I've lost weight, but I still need a lot more to lose and to be healthy and holy for the Lord. Revelation, how, how have you enjoyed these series? Because I know it's quite controversial for those who are from a Protestant background. Have you enjoyed these series on the biblical basis for veneration of the saints? Have they been a challenge? And listen, I appreciate brothers and sisters who re reject this belief and disagree with me, but still love me for the sake of the Lord and agree to disagree. All right. We got some great brothers and sisters here. Yeah, I know you did. And I like Love Life. I think he likes me too. Not too much though, but tell him I know where he lives. And I'll come and lay hands on him. And I mean that to bless him, not to hurt him. He yo. Right. Orbit is here. Thank the Lord. All right. I just want to deal with one objection. One objection. It was brought up by someone. I don't want to mention his name because he's a brother in Jesus Christ, but he's been shocked. He's shocked that I embrace communion saints on the basis of scripture. So he tried to come up with verses to refute me without mentioning me in the thread, without linking to these YouTube discussions. But I know he was directing it to me, right, Syrian brother. And he misused Deuteronomy 18, verses 9 to 14. God bless you, John 3, 17. Uh, Stephen, sorry, Stephen, you know I'm going to have to bounce you, right? Okay, guys, did you see what Stephen did? Stephen asked me, does Revelation teach salvation by works? It seems so. When I refuted him, he then misquotes Revelation 14, 12 to try to teach otherwise. So this means he doesn't have a spirit to learn. He has a spirit to debate. Stephen, you know you're leaving now, right? Sorry, but I'm not going to allow people to cause me to stumble so I don't cause others to stumble. But Stephen, it was nice knowing you. Find you another YouTube channel. This is not for you. Sorry. Hold on, friend. See? That's what happens. If you want to debate me, here. Okay, here, here. Here's here, here's a request. If you want to debate me, set up a debate or a dialogue. Set up a dialogue. I'll come. But when I'm teaching, don't come here to debate with me because this is not the time to debate. I'm here to teach and answer genuine, sincere questions. But if you want to debate, set it up. If you want a dialogue, set it up. I, You know I'm not afraid of debates. You really know that. You guys know that by now. I'm not, but don't come here and debate me because this is not the time. This is the time to teach. And if you want to teach, start a YouTube channel and teach. That's between you and the Lord. All right? Thank you, Charles. I hope I look better and I get holier for the Lord, for the glory of Christ. Holier for the glory of Christ. Okay. Now, here's a passage that was used, that was used to try to prove that veneration of the saints, asking the saints to pray, goes against scripture. And again, let me be honest for the record. When I was against this doctrine, I also misused these same passages. 1 Timothy 2.5 was one. Now let me show you the other passage that's misused to show that, you know what? You can't ask glorified believers in heaven to pray because that's contacting the dead and violating scripture. Let's get, get into it. You ready? And then we go into, does Luke and Acts teach that there are two messages of salvation? Deuteronomy 18 verses 9 and 14. Deuteronomy 18, verse 9 and 14. I'm just going to address this real quickly. Get any good commentary because you will need commentaries that give you the historical cultural background to these passages because many of the laws given to the Israelites 
were given in the context of the historical cultural background that the Israelites faced because they're dealing with the nations who were pagans, idolaters, and grossly immoral. So many of these commands have a direct bearing on the historical cultural context and background that the Israelites lived in. Are you with me? Are you understanding by the grace of Jesus? So let's read Deuteronomy 18, 9 and 14, and then I'm going to address what it doesn't mean. This was a passage misused to try to refute. And the, the gentleman even went to the Hebrew darash as if darash proved the point. But that's okay. I also misuse these passages. I'm guilty too. As for Timothy 2.5. Oh, and by the way, for the record. Well, let me read this passage first. Let me read it. Deuteronomy 18.9 to 14. Now notice Yehovah is talking to the Israelites when they enter Canaan and dispossess the Canaanites. When thou art come into the land which Yehovah thy God giveth thee, Thou shalt not learn to do after the abominations of those nations. So don't learn their practices. And this is what they did. There shall not be found among you anyone that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire. Pass through the fire. Or that useth divination or an observer of times or an enchanter or a witch. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Don't do these things. There shall not be <clears throat> found among you that do these things. For all the, that... All that do these things are an abomination unto Yahovah, and because of these abominations, Yahovah thy God doth drive them out from before thee. Right? We well, I skipped so because orbiter, I'm gonna stone him to death. Just because you're helping man doesn't mean you get to butcher the order of the verses. I'm gonna smash your face and then repent. I was supposed to read verse 11. I don't know why you got it in reverse order. Here's verse 11. Or a charmer or a consulter with familiar spirits. Don't do these things. Be a charmer or consulter with familiar spirits or a wizard or a necromancer. Contacts the dead. For all that do these things are an abomination unto Yahovah. And because of these abominations, Yahovah thy God doth drive them up from before thee. Thou shalt be perfect with Yahovah thy God. And then 14. For these nation, nations which thou shalt possess, hearken unto observers of times. Unto diviners or diviners, but as for thee, Yahovah thy God hath not suffered thee so to do. Okay, this is you supposedly to show that if you ask saints in heaven to pray for you, you are contacting the dead, necromancy, you're violating scripture, right? And I used to misuse this also to teach the same thing. You with me there? Now, let me just read. Two commentaries, one from Adam Clark and then the other from Chabad.org where they quote the medieval rabbi Rashi, the medieval rabbi Rashi. So you ready now? What do these terms mean? What did they mean in their historical context and are they applicable to asking saints to pray for you? Are you ready? Because I want to just deal with this passage once and for all and move into the other subject. Are you guys ready? Like juju? Exactly, medic for Christ. Necromancy is different. It's allowing spirits to possess you and speak through you, use you as a channel to communicate messages. Okay, let us let me read now. I'm going to read Adam Clark. This is online, by the way. Adam Clark's Bible commentary you can read. So I'm reading things that's accessible. To pass through the fire, probably in the way of concentration to Moloch, because the Canaanites were known for offering their children as a sacrifice to Moloch. And archaeologists have confirmed because they found the bones of many children in Canaan. And so they would have a statue of Moloch with the arms outstretched, and they would heat up the arms so that when they put the baby, the baby would be burnt to a crisp as a sacrifice to Moloch or some other deity. It is not likely that they're being burnt to death as you intended. <clears throat> Yes, it is likely, but so, and anyway, we understand the historical context. Divination, kosam, kasamim, one who endeavors to find out futurity by auguries, using lots, etc., using lots, like casting arrows and so forth. Observer of times, <clears throat> meonin, sorry, I'm butchering the Hebrew like I butcher English. English. One who pretends to foretell future events by present occurrences, <clears throat> One who predicts great political or physical changes from the aspects of the planets, eclipses, motion of the clouds, etc., etc. Enchan enchanter, manachish, 
Manachish, from Nachish, Nechesh. To view attentively, pay attention to what these words mean. One who inspected the entrails of beasts, they would cut open the animals and take out the entrails like the intestines and read the intestines, the entrails of beasts. <clears throat> Observe the flight of birds, the way the birds fl flew. Oh, wow, look. <clears throat> Excedric certain drew auguries then. Something divination by spirits, uh, serpents, I'm sorry, serpents is meant, which was common among the heathen. A witch. Machashef, probably those who by means of drugs, using psychedelic drugs, pharmaceuticals, right? Means of drugs, herbs, perfumes, etc., pretended to bring certain celestial influences to their aid. A charmer, chober, chober, chaber, one who uses spells, a peculiar conjunction, as the term implies, of words or things, tying knots, using knots to tie knots for the purposes of divination. This was a custom among the heathen, as we learn from the following verses. And he quotes the sources. A consulter with familiar spirits, Shoel, a Pyth Pythonus, Pythonus, one who acquires by the means of one spirit to get oracular answers from another of a superior order. So you contact the spirit, tell the spirit to come and speak through you and, and make things known to you. A wizard, Yidioni, Yidioni, ah. These languages. A wise one, a knowing one. Wizard was formerly considered as the masculine of which, both practicing divination by similar means. Now, the word necromancer. Daresh, Daresh el Hamathim. Daresh el Hamathim. One who seeks from or inquires of the dead, such as the witch at Endor, who professed to evoke the dead, ask a spirit to appear, ask the spirit to show up, ask the spirit to enter you and through you. That's what basically Adam Clark is saying in order to get them to disclose the secrets of the spiritual world. Does this, in all honesty, honest to God, sound like what the Orthodox, the Catholic, the Coptics, the Church of the East are doing when they ask saints in heaven to pray for them? Does this passage really apply to this practice? Honestly, if you're going to be honest to God, honest to the context and the meaning of words, So why would we use this passage like I used to, to condemn it? Because we didn't know any better. But now that you know, will you misuse it this way? Now, let's read Rashi, a medieval rabbi. His exposition of these passages, and let me give you the link. Okay? You ready? There you go. Let's read his exposition. Are you ready? I hope you're not getting bored. I'm hoping to educate you by the grace of God. Okay. To pass through the fire. Okay, I'm sorry. Wrong one. Wrong link. Sorry. Did I give you the right link? No, I gave you the wrong link, and I went to the wrong page. Sorry again. Here you go. Yep. That was Adam Clark, so save it. Here you go. Okay. Who passes his son or daughter through fi fire. This is now Rashi, a medieval rabbi. This was the Malek worship. Malek. They made two bonfires on either side and passed the child between them both. Sanhedrin 64b. A soothsayer. What is a soothsayer? One who takes his rod in his hand and says, as though to consult it, shall I go or shall I not go? Similarly, it says, Hosea 4.12, my people takes counsel of his piece of wood and his rod declares to him. Sifri. A diviner or diviner of auspicious times. Rabbi Akiva. These are people who determine the times, saying, such and such a time is good to begin a venture. The sages say, however, that this refers to those who catch the eyes, i.e. they deceive by creating optical illusions like magicians. And I added the word magicians, by the way. One who interprets omens, bread falling from his mouth, a deer crossing his path, or stick falling from his hand. Oh, that means this, right? Or a charmer. One who collects snakes, scorpions, or other creatures into one place. A pitham sorcerer. This is a type of sorcery called pitham. The sorcerer raises the spirit of de the dead and speaks from his sorcerer's armpit. <laughs> a yidoa sorcerer. Here the sorcerer inserts a bone of the animal called the yidoa into his mouth and the bone speaks by means of sorcery. Sifre, 65a. Or a necromancer, as, for example, one who raises the dead spirit upon his membrum 
or one who consults us go. In all honesty, if we're going to be honest to God, do any of these things resemble what Roman Catholics, Orthodox, Nestorians, Coptics do when they say, St. Paul, please ask Jesus to help me. Blessed Mother of our Lord Jesus, please ask Jesus to help me. Are they summoning them down to speak through them? Is that what they're doing? Yep, in Aramaic. Then why would we misuse Deuteronomy 18, 9 to 14 to condemn the practice of veneration of the saints? And let's just, as a point of God's fidelity, fidelity to his church, you will find evidence, at least from the second century onwards, where those representing the true church, not the heretics, the true members of the body of Christ, the Orthodox believers who defended the truth, who even died as martyrs for the truth, like Athanasius and others, asking saints in heaven, like the Blessed Mother, and another one, Saint Ephraim the Syrian. If I read to you the way Saint Ephraim invoked Mary, the Blessed Mother of our Lord, and he was Assyrian. He was one of our physical ancestors, Assyrians. Saint Ephraim the Syrian, right? Are you saying that all these individuals who represented the true church of Jesus Christ, who defended orthodoxy against heterodoxy, against false teaching, and died as martyrs. All of them were violating Deuteronomy 18, 9 to 14 when they asked the Blessed Mother of our Lord or others to pray for them. They were in violation of Deuteronomy 18, and God did nothing to stop them from that se severe, idolatrous, blasphemous practice. And they were the ones pres preserving the true church of Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit? Is that what you want to say? Really, guys? Folks, just because you reject that doctrine, don't misuse the Bible in this manner to attack it. Just say, I don't accept it. Doesn't make sense to me. And I'm not convinced there's a biblical basis for it. Okay, leave it be. That's it. That's it. Leave it be. But don't misuse scripture because you're going to end up proving too much. You're going to end up that early on the church apostatized so badly that even those true Christians who represented the Orthodox faith, the true faith, and defended it against heretics and died, lost their way so early on. So where was Jesus to preserve the true church? You get my point? We all did, Medic. Now that we got that out of the way, folks, there is no good passage, and I'm going to go on record. I know people are going to respond to me and try to refute me. That's fine. If you want to set up a dialogue debate, we'll do it, and hopefully by the grace of God's Spirit, we'll do it respectfully. But let me just be honest. There is no good objection against this practice from the Bible. There are no passages that you can quote in context and accurately to show that this practice is unbiblical. I'm being honest to scripture, not to tradition, not to the Catholic church. I'm not Roman Catholic, not to Orthodox. I'm not Orthodox or the church of the East. I'm not. I'm trying to be honest to scripture. See, Kathy said, oh my goodness. No, it doesn't add new doctrine of scripture. Kathy, please don't use these objections. Please. Uh, well, he can say what he wants. Anyway, I was going to address Kathy, but you know what? That argument is such a bad argument. I'm going to ignore it. Kathy, well, let here. Kathy, you're going to have to answer this question. Okay. If it ain't in the Acts or the Epistles, okay. Okay, Kathy, wait, wait. I'm going to block you after you answer this question, but you better answer. I want you to show me a single verse in the very sources that you refer to where it says in the exact words, glorify the Holy Spirit, worship the Holy Spirit, and or pray to the Holy Spirit. I want that precise language. Show it to me because I'm going to block you right after this. Show it to me.
Kathy, don't drag my time. Show it to me. I just want to wait her for answer because she thought she was being slick here. Folks, it's taken me 20 years to come to this position. And I came to this position several years ago. See, you notice her response. Now you're doing dawah. No, you did dawah. You're the one who did dawah by demanding of me something that you yourself cannot live up to if I hold you to the same standard. Bye-bye, Kathy. Thank you for proving you get an answer and you can live up to your own criterion. Thank you. And by the way, you are to glorify the Holy Spirit. You are to worship the Holy Spirit. You are to pray to the Holy Spirit because the Bible says he is God. Go to my YouTube page. I have, I believe, four discussions on the divine personhood of the Holy Spirit. Old Testament evidence that the Holy Spirit is God and a person of God. Distinct from the Father and Son, one with them in essence, and New Testament evidence. I believe there are four parts. I may be mistaken, but it's on my YouTube page. And by the way, subscribe and hit the like button. Yep. Are we now ready to de address this misrepresentation of Scripture that says, and this is only a form of dispensationalism that's not held by all dispensationalists. There are individuals that believe that up until the conversion of the Apostle Paul, the apostles of Jesus were sent out to preach a different message of salvation. The message of salvation they preached was, Repent and be baptized and Jesus will be saved. But when the Jews rejected Jesus, there goes the buffering again. It's okay. It's that's we gotta do what we gotta do. This is the best we can do. Okay. Hold on, let me do something here. There's a buffering again. What? Hold on. Sorry. Okay, how's it doing now? Okay, I, I, I brought down the resolution. Okay, all right. Anyway, is it good now? You heard most of it. At least most of the connection was good. Okay. Anyway, we're going to deal with this claim that up until the conversion of Paul, the message that the apostles were sent to preach was repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. But when the Jews rejected Jesus and God turned his attention to the Gentiles, then he revealed... This is what this group teaches. Then he revealed for the first time to Paul that redemption comes by grace through faith in the blood of Jesus. That it's the blood of Jesus that cleanses you and it's faith in Jesus that saves you. Are you clear there? Are, you understand what I'm going to be refuting? Andrew, good to see you, man. I hope you've been benefiting and being blessed by these series. Andrew is an atheist that has a very open heart and mind. And though he's an atheist, he aches for Jesus. And in time, he'll fall in love with Jesus again by the power of the Holy Spirit. I really like this guy. He's not one of these militant atheists. And he comes and listens to me. That's That actually blesses me. That of all the people you come listen to me, I can't stand my voice or the way I look. Well, right now, you know what? I'm starting to look so good that I'm actually, you know, I'm attracting myself. Sam, you ain't bad looking. If I was a woman, I'd marry you. But anyway, you gorgeous Sam, you. Anyway, but he comes and listens to me, right? Thank God for that. What an honor. Okay, I'm going to now show you that the assertion that redemption by the blood of Jesus, redemption by faith in the blood of Jesus was only revealed to Paul is nonsense. You with me there? The message that you are saved by grace alone through faith in Jesus Christ who redeemed you by his blood was something taught by Christ to the apostles even before Paul. Are you ready for the evidence? I don't know why Darius Cole keeps putting two. Why are you putting two? He's confusing me. Mark Saro, why are you hating, man? Because I'm one gorgeous Assyrian. Assyrians are beautiful. Ezekiel says so. Hater, man. Hater. He's got this fake picture of someone with abs. You may have a six pack. I have a keg. Okay. Pablo, are you ready for the refutation? Did the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, even before Paul's conversion, know that you're redeemed by the blood 
And you're saved by grace through faith in Jesus. Little choppy. I know. Here, let me do this again. Okay. All right, let's begin. Luke 22, 19 to 20. Uh, Darius Cole, how do you not see a difference between the two positions? Let me repeat it again. I hope I was clear. The position says that redemption through faith in the blood of Christ was unknown to the apostles because it was only revealed to the apostle Paul when Christ converted him. What do you mean you don't see a difference? Do you understand the difference, guys? I just want to make sure it says, I don't see, how, what do you mean you don't see the difference? That means the apostles did not know that they're redeemed by the blood of Christ through faith in Christ until it was revealed to Paul. Do you understand the difference now? Before I move on? Guys, can you hear me? Because I repeated myself five times. I don't know if it's my connection or Darius Cole is not listening too carefully. And normally he's not a brother that causes problems or division. So I just want to make sure. Because I read it, I repeat it about five times. I don't know why he's having a hard time following the argument. Okay. All right, Darius. I'm just going to proceed. Okay. Luke 22, 19 to 20. Luke 22, 19 to 20. May the Lord crucify our flesh and help me overcome my flesh. Okay. Luke 22, 19 to 20. And he took bread and gave thanks and break it, break it and gave unto them saying, this is my body which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. Likewise also the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the New Testament in my blood which is shed for you. So Pablo, because you asked me to deal with this, here. Did you see that on the night of Jesus' betrayal, when he instituted the Lord's Supper, he told the apostles, Paul wasn't there, Paul hadn't converted, he told the apostles that this bread represents my body broken for you. This cup is a new covenant in my blood shed for you. Are you telling me that after Jesus tells them that these elements point to my body and blood broken and shed for you, they still didn't know it's the blood of Christ that saves them? It's Jesus' death on the cross that saves them? Do you guys see? Now let's look at the Matthean parallel to the Lord's Supper. Matthew 26, 26 to 28. Matthew 26, 26 to 28. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and break it and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. So eat my body. And he took the blood and gave thanks and gave it to them saying, drink ye all of it. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. So again, Pablo, everyone else, you're telling me the apostles of our Lord Jesus did not know the blood of Jesus was being shed to forgive them of their sins, to wash them of their sins, to cleanse them, cleanse them of their sins. Does that make me more handsome, Maria? You know, I'm trying to get married now. No, I'm kidding. Well, now I am. If God has a godly woman, his will be done. I hope you don't mind me joking. Okay, so it's clear now, right? They must have known it's the blood of Christ which he sheds and his body which will be broken on the cross that redeems us. Okay, Mark 10, 45. Mark 10, 45. Mark 10, 45. Bear with me as I go slow, systematically, methodically showing you that they knew the doctrine that said we're redeemed by the blood of Christ through faith in that blood, faith in Jesus, long before Paul. Mark 10, 45. For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. If you read the Greek word, suche, it's soul. I will give up my soul to ransom you. So wait. Jesus, you're going to give up your life to ransom us? And how are you going to give up your life? On the cross, which will be broken. Your body will be broken. Your blood shed. Yes, that's how I'm going to ransom you. Oh, okay. Interesting. John 6, 50 
to 58. John 6, 50 to 58. No, they're saying that they didn't teach the blood redeems because they did not know that until it was made known to, to Paul. By the way, Pablo, that's what they teach, right? Because I've heard it, but I want you to confirm. This movement teaches that they did not know the blood redeems because that revelation was kept from them and given to Paul when Paul was sent to the Gentiles, right? Just want to confirm not misrepresenting because that's what I heard them teach. Okay, John 6, 50 to 51. Now watch, Pablo and everyone else, this is Jesus speaking on earth before his death to the apostles, the other disciples, and to unbelievers. Notice what he says. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven that a man may eat thereof and not die. John 6, 50 to 58. Let's read. Let's read the word of God by the power of the Holy Spirit illuminating us. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh. So wait, I'm going to give you my flesh as bread so that you eat my flesh so that you can live, which I will give for the life of the world. My flesh I give for the life of the world. Okay, let's, let's continue reading. The Jews therefore strove among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man, and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Whoso eateth, right, <clears throat> my flesh, and drinketh my blood, hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat, food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh, and drinketh my blood, dwelleth in me, and I in him. As the living Father hath sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. <clears throat> for my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. This is that bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat the manna and are dead. He that eateth of this bread shall live forever. So Jesus says, my flesh will give you life, my blood will give you life. And we know this is in reference to the context of him offering his flesh on the cross. Right? So they're hearing it's his blood and his flesh that gives life. And they heard on the Lord's Supper, I'm shedding my blood to save you, breaking my body for you. Right? Now, did they think that it's, see, this is going to lie. Uh, all right. Anyway, did they know already before Paul that it is faith in Jesus? trusting in Jesus and what he would do for them on the cross that saves them. Did they know that? Did they know they were saved by the grace of Jesus and living that perfect life they were supposed to live and dying the death they deserved that saved them and that salvation was theirs by trusting in him, believing in him? Did they know that? Okay, let's see if they knew. Let's go to Luke 8, 12. Luke 8, 12. Luke 8, 12. I hope it's not going to bore you and put you to sleep because I got a lot of passages that I'm going to be quoting. Lots of passages. Those by the wayside, Jesus is giving a parable of the four types of soil that the seed fell on. Seed fell on. One soil that the seed, meaning the word of God, the seed is the word of God, fell on. Soils means individuals, human beings. Those by the wayside are they that hear... Then cometh the devil and taketh away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. What? It's believing the word from your heart that saves you. But the devil tries to snatch the word before you believe it from your heart. So here it says, it's the word that you believe that saves you. So Satan tries to stop you from hearing the word so you don't believe in the word so you don't get saved. Right? Luke 8, 43 to 48. Luke 8, 43 to 48. Luke 8, 43 to 48. John Williams, don't be distracted and change the subject. The subject is salvation. Let's just focus on that. Luke 8, 43 to 48. And a woman having an issue of blood 12 years, 
which had spent all her living upon physicians, neither could be healed of any, came behind, behind him and touched the border of his garment, and immediately her issue of blood stench. So she touched him because she believed. She said in her heart, if only I can teach, uh, touch the hem of her garments, I'll be healed. So that's what she believed. Now watch what our Lord says. And Jesus said, who touched me? And I'll deny Peter and they that were with him. For some reason, your passages are in reverse order. Said, Master, the multitude throng thee and press thee and sayest thou who touched me? And Jesus said, somebody had touched me for I perceive, I sense that virtue, power has gone out of me. Power came out of me when I got touched. Power to heal. Because Jesus is filled with the power of God, the divine power to heal. Right? Now watch here, 47. And when the woman saw that she was not hit, she came trembling and falling down before him. She de declared unto him before all the people for what cause she had touched him. Now notice 48. And he said unto her, Daughter, be of good comfort. Thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace. Now the word made thee whole, if you look at the Greek word, it also means saved you. Look at any Greek lexicon. That word made thee whole also means saved you. So notice what Jesus said. Because you believed in me, you believed and trusted that I could heal you, go. Your faith has healed you. Go in peace. Not on this earth, Jeremiah. No, Jeremy. As long as you have sin in your flesh, it's going to be a war until you die. Okay. Did you see that? Now, what's interesting why did the why was the woman afraid to identify herself? Because according to the Levitical law, a woman with an issue of blood, a bleeding disorder, could not be touched. She had to be quarantined because anyone who came near her would become ceremonially unclean. So can you imagine the pain of this woman? Let me unpack this and bring out the meat. It says for 12 years she had a bleeding disorder. Now, guys, can you can you do you want to go in depth? Do you want me to give you meat by the power of the Holy Spirit? Or do you want me to keep it surface? Do you want meat? You guys want meat? Okay. Okay, now let's unpack this. Let me bring out the deep spiritual beauty of this story. A woman. A woman. Bleeding disorder, 12 years. Went to many physicians. They could not heal her. The physicians could not heal her. Bleeding disorder, according to law, that means for 12 years she lived in misery because she had to live in isolation. She had to be quarantined. Can you imagine living in isolation with no contact, human contact? And according to the law, if anyone touched her, they would become unclean ceremonially, not morally. But now notice the power of Jesus that you have a woman with a bleeding disorder touching him, and instead of defiling him, he is so incorruptible, so pure, so impeccable, that nothing defiles him, but by touching him, he cleanses you. His purity is more pow powerful than your defilement and sin. Your sin can't <clears throat> taint him, but his holiness can purify you. Anyone else would be defiled, but because Jesus is holiness, purity in the flesh, immutable purity, impeccable, holiness itself in the flesh, sin cannot defile him, but his holiness destroys sin and cleanses you. Do you see how powerful Jesus is? In fact, according to the law, Jesus did things that the law said should have defiled him. For example, in Matthew 8, 1 of 4, a man who had leprosy, right? Leprosy of the skin, right? Told Jesus, if you're willing, you can make me clean. He goes, I'm willing, and touched him. According to law, he was not to be touched because to touch a man with an infectious skin disease would make you unclean according to the law. Jesus could have simply commanded the man to be Heal, but he deliberately touched him. Do you know why? Because again, that man, as long as he had that condition, would have to be quarantined 
which means that man lived for a period of time without human touch. Can you imagine having no one to hug you, no one to kiss you because of your infectious skin disease? People had to stay away from you. This would have been the first time in years that he actually had a human being touch him in compassion. So Jesus, seeing his need, didn't simply say, you're cleansed. He goes, I'm going to do something even more. I'm going to touch you. And he touched him. That's how much Jesus loves us. See the depth of his love? Or what about Jairus' daughter? Luke 8, 44 to 50. Jairus' daughter was dead, and only family members could attend to the dead, right? Thank you, James Snap. I love this guy. He's a hero of my in the faith. By the way, guys, James Snap is one of the leading scholars of the Greek New Testament. He's here. Get in contact with him on Facebook. He is one of the leading scholars of the Greek New Testament. And because of his research, he has now given me the confidence to say that Mark 16, 9 to 20 is part of Mark, that Mark wrote it by inspiration. The story of the woman caught in adultery, John 7, 53, 8, 11, that's genuine scripture penned by John because of his outstanding research. He has shown that these passages that other scholars have called into question are part of what these authors originally wrote by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So praise God for this man. He's giving us another side of the evidence that many scholars do not give us and thereby giving us the misleading impression it's not true. I love this man. But it doesn't mean I won't attack him if he gets on my, my nerves. No, just kidding, bro. Just kidding. Now, Luke 8, 49. I'm sorry. Luke 8, 44, 50. Jairus' daughter is dead. Only the family members <clears throat> could get in contact with the dead body in order to take care of her burial. You know what Jesus did? He touched her, grabbed her by the hand, and said, Talitha kum. And the spirit returned to her body and rose to life. Notice, Jesus does what the law says shouldn't be done. Touching dead bodies, touching infectious skin diseases, touching a woman or a woman touching him with a bleeding disorder, and none of them could defile him because he's immutably holy, impeccably holy, impossible for him to be defiled. But his holiness is so powerful that his holiness cleanses them, purifies them, destroys their defilement. Amazing or what? Am I putting you guys to sleep? Is this amazing or what? Okay. Now let me bring out the spiritual significance of the story of the woman. You ready? Let me bring out the spiritual. Is it a coincidence that the story of this woman with a bleeding disorder and the daughter of Jairus is found in the same chapter? Both stories are found in the same chapter. Now I want you to see a connection between the two. The woman had a bleeding disorder for 12, 12 years. Jairus' daughter was a damsel, a maiden who was 12 years old. In other words, this woman was bleeding for as long as that girl was alive. Did you catch it or no? Guys, are you being blown away by the depth and beauty of the Holy Bible? The woman, the woman was bleeding for as long as Jairus' daughter was alive. She was bleeding for 12 years. She was dead at 12. She was 12 years old at the time. Now, do you think that's a coincidence that this woman was bleeding for 12 years and this damsel is 12 years old? No, because you know why? God is trying to teach you something spiritual through these miraculous stories that took place. A woman bleeding for 12 years, going to many physicians, could not be healed. Only Jesus could heal her. Now, let me bring out the spiritual significance. Woman, Israel is often called a woman. 12 years, 12 tribes, goes to many physicians, prophets, and none of those prophets could heal her. Only Jesus can heal Israel.
Did you catch it? This woman becomes a picture of Israel. A woman. 12 years. The physicians could not heal her. The prophets could not heal her. Only one could, Jesus Christ our Lord. Jairus' daughter, a damsel, a young woman, dead at 12. Jesus says she's not dead, she's asleep. What's the point? Israel is not de dead yet. Israel is in a state of slumber, and I have come to awaken Israel in order to give Israel life. Thank you, Susan Baker. That's what you're supposed to see in these stories. Yes, that's why it's significant. 12, 12 tribes, woman. Israel's described as a woman. Young damsel, Israel. The damsel's not dead. She's asleep. Israel's not dead yet. Israel is in a state of slumber. And I've come to awaken Israel from her slumber. Israel had many physicians, prophets coming to her, but the prophets could not heal her because I alone am Yahovah, her healer. Yahovah Rapha. I am Jehovah who heals. Are you seeing it or no? Thank you, medic, for the confirmation. Because at times I feel like I should give it up because I'm too angry, too impatient, and I get attacked too much. But I need confirmation that this is what God wants me to do. And pray for him to do a miracle to save me out of this trial. Amazing stuff, huh? So now I gave you the spiritual meat. What did our Lord say to her in Luke 8, 48? I'm, yeah, Luke 8, 48. Luke 8, 48 again. And he said unto her, daughter, be of good comfort. Thy faith hath made thee whole. Go look at the Greek. It also means saved you. Go in peace. With me? Go in peace. Now let's look at Luke 7, 48 to 50. Did Jesus preach? Did the apostles already know that you're saved by the grace of Jesus, by trusting in him, believing in him, having faith in him? Luke 7, 48 to 50. Thanks, James. We got Orbit. He's going to post for us, bro. Thank you. Just keep sending me your books for free, and I'll keep advertising. No, I'm just kidding. Luke 7, 48 to 50. Luke 7, 48 to 50. And he said unto her, Thy sins are forgiven. And they that sat at meat with him began to say within themselves, Who is this that forgiveth sins alone also? Who is this that forgives sins as well? This is God in the flesh. Now notice verse 50. And he said to the woman, Thy faith has saved thee. Go in peace. What saved you? What brought about the forgiveness of your sins? Your faith in me, trusting in me, believing in me. Right? Okay, now, let's go to Mark 2. Mark 2, verses 1 of 5. Mark 2, verses 1 of 5. Let's see. So I'm going to refute this doctrine that says, the apostles did not know that they were saved by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, redeemed by his blood, which they received by faith in him, because that was only made known to the apostle Paul after his conversion. Mark 2, verses 1 of 5. And again, he entered into Capernaum after some days, and it was noised that he was in the house. And straightway, many were gathered together, insomuch that there was no room to receive them. No, not so much as about the door. And he preached the word unto them. And they came unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, meaning a paralytic, which was born of four, carried by four. And when they could not come nigh unto him for the press, they uncovered the roof where he was. And when they had broken it up, they let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. Now notice what our Lord says. When Jesus saw their faith, how do you see faith? Faith is something in the heart. Well, Jesus can see what's in your heart. That's number one. But you see someone's faith by their actions. So number one, true faith will be manifested in your actions. 
True faith will be revealed in your deeds. So he saw their action, and their action proved they had faith to be saved. So he's, when he saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. Luke 17, it's a long one. It's a long one. Should we read from 11 to 19? There were 10 who had <clears throat> leprosy. 10 who had leprosy. Jesus healed them. Only one returned and gave thanks to Jesus. So I'm going to skip Luke 17, 11 to 18. We're going to look at Luke 17, verse 19. Luke 17, verse 19, for the sake of time. You can read it on your own, Luke 17, verses 11 and 19, but we're going to only look at Luke 17, 19 for the sake of time. Right? Luke 17, verse 19. And he said unto him, Arise, go thy way. Thy faith hath made thee whole. Thy faith has saved you. Thy faith has made you well. Wow. It's all about faith. <laughs> Luke 18. This is where our Lord Jesus heals the blind man, Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus. Again, for the sake of time, we'll pick it up. Luke 18. Let's pick it up at 41 to 43. Luke 18, 41 to 43. How many minutes has this been? Oh, it's been an hour. Luke 18, 41 to 43. Thank you, King of Kings. Thank you for seeing the good in Jesus' name. Okay. Luke 18, 41 to 43. Saying, What wilt thou that I shall do unto thee? And he said, Lord, that I may receive thy sight. And Jesus said unto him, Receive thy sight. Thy faith hath saved thee. Thy faith has saved you. You believing in me, trusting in me that I have the power to do this? Your faith. Pablo, how many verses do you need to see that it's faith, faith, faith in Jesus, in Jesus, trusting, believing, having faith in Jesus that heals you, that saves you? Pablo, how many verses do you need? Are you getting it, Pablo? Do you want to make sure? Now, Pablo, these are verses that take place while the Lord Jesus Christ is on earth in front of all the disciples long before his death. So how can someone in their right mind say that this doctrine, that you are saved by faith in Jesus, redeemed by his blood, was unknown to them until Paul's conversion years after Jesus' ascension? How is that possible, Pablo? They must not be reading the Bible with care and reading it <clears throat> consistently. Let's go to the Gospel of John. Gospel of John. Let's see what our Lord taught about salvation. John 3, 14 to 17. John 3, 14 to 18. I'm sorry. Why did I say 17? John 3, 14 to 18. In time, Philip Rene, in time. John 3, 14, 18. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have ever eternal life. Believeth in the Son of Man who will be lifted up, will bring, you, bring about eternal life, will bring you salvation. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, <clears throat> that whosoever believeth in him <clears throat> should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Wow, Jesus preaching, when the Son of Man is lifted up, anyone who looks to the Son, believes in the Son, will have everlasting life. For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son into the world, not to condemn it, but that the world might live through him. Whoever believes in the only begotten son will be saved and receive everlasting life. Interesting. John 5, 24. 
Interesting. I'm going to have to do another part on this doctrine, Lord willing, because I won't finish it in one session. And the condemnation, mom, is not believing in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Verily, verily, son, sin, uh, Lord Jesus, loosen my tongue. Verily, verily, I send to you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but his paths pass from death unto life. Yep, Hezekiah destroyed in 2 Kings 18, verse 4. Read verses 1 of 4 for the context, James Snap. 2 Kings 18, verse 4. John 6, 27 to 29. John 6, 27 to 29. Watch here. The Bible is amazing and supernatural. Eunice, that's Paul. They'll say, yeah, Paul knew that. I'm showing you Jesus taught it to the disciples before Paul. Labor not, John 6, 27, 29. Labor not for the meat which perisheth, food that will spoil, but for that food, that meat, which endureth until everlasting life, which the Son of Man, the Lord Jesus Christ, shall give unto you. For him hath God the Father sealed. Notice their, their question, their request. Then said they unto him, what shall we do that we might work the works of God? What work does God require that we can get this meat? What is the work that I must do to get this meat that is just everlasting life? 29, folks, pay attention. 29, Jesus answered and said unto him, This is the work of God, that ye believe on him whom he hath sent. You want that food that endures forever, where you will never die, never hunger, never thirst? Believe on me. Trust in me. Trust in me. John 6, 35 to 40. Amen, Zena. John 6, 35 to 40. Okay. Stop changing the section, session into something else. Focus, because I don't want to block you, friend. John 6, 35 to 40. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Believe on me. Come to me by faith. Trust in me. Never hunger, never thirst. But I said unto you that ye also have seen me and believe not. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. For I came down from heaven not to do Mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. Now, guys, pay attention to 39 and 40. How are you saved? Remember, Jesus is teaching this before the cross, before his death, before Paul, and the apostles are hearing this. <clears throat> John 6, 39 to 40. And this is the Father's will which has sent me, that of all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. Verse 40. And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him, anyone who believes on the Son, right, may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Pablo, how many more verses do you need to be convinced their doctrine is wrong? How many more verses do I need to show you from the Gospels, from the historical Jesus, Jesus on earth, before his death, before Paul, teaching the apostles and unbelievers, trust in me, believe in me, you'll be saved. And I will shed my life and give my life for your salvation. Shed my blood, offer my soul for your salvation. Question, side note. What power must the Lord Jesus Christ have to guarantee that none of the believers that God gives them will ever perish. None of them will he cast away, but he will perfectly preserve everyone that God gives, gives him, preserve them forever, and he will raise them physically to immortal life at the last day. That's what Jesus just said in John 6, 39 and 40. He said, I'm going to do it. I will lose none of them. I will cast none of them away. All who come to me, I will preserve and raise them all up at the last day. 
What kind of power is Jesus claiming to possess? The almighty power of God. But he also must know how many have been given to, the, to him. Whom has been given to him. And he must be able to guarantee their everlasting security. No matter where they're at. No matter what trials they face. He must guarantee that they will never perish, never be consumed, never be destroyed, but he has the power to preserve them perfectly. That is my Jesus, a Jesus who claimed to be almighty God in the flesh, one with the Father and the Spirit, who is all-powerful, all-knowing. That's my Jesus. That's the Jesus of history who walked this earth, who's now alive in heaven, and who by the power of his blood will save me and my children and will deliver me from this child because it cannot destroy me, Lord Jesus. Because there is no power on earth that is equal to yours or can prevail against you. And you are my God, my Lord, my love, my life, my Savior, and my children's God. And we trust in you. Son of God, we love you. I will not be destroyed because my Redeemer lives, my Jesus lives, and he loves me, and I know you love me, and I love you. <clears throat> I love you. We all love you. John 6, 44. John 6, 44. Watch here. I love you, medic, too. <clears throat> No man come come to me except the Father which has sent me. Draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. I will raise him up at the last day. John six forty seven. John six forty seven. Susan, Jesus is my God, and I'm not just saying it. And I don't trust in myself. I trust in the Holy Spirit. I'm in love with the Holy Spirit. I love the Holy Spirit. Unfortunately, imperfectly. But the Holy Spirit is my God, my shield, my hope, the Spirit of the Father and the Son, Jesus. He will preserve me. Homeless, in the streets, in prison, no matter where, he will preserve me. Because even death will not sever me from the Father and the Son by the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay? John 6, 47. Verily, verily, I send to you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. We're going to end it with John. There's a lot of passages. But guys, Lord willing, I'm going to do a part two. And I'm going to have to do it on Monday, God willing. Yes, 316 he is. But he has been crushed and vanquished under the feet of Jesus. And I have the victory over against Satan by the blood of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Okay. That was John 6. Now, let's go to John 10. <clears throat> John 10, 27 and 30. John 10, 27 and 30. We're going to do just the gospel of John, but I'm going to do a part two, God willing, Monday, because tomorrow I got a busy day, Lord willing. John 10, 27 and 30. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. And I give unto them this flock of sheep, so numerous can't be counted. I give to all of them, all of them, I give to all of them everlasting life. They shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all. No man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. I give all the sheep everlasting life, and they will never perish because there's no power to take them out of my hand of protection and no power to take them out of the hand of my father, his loving hand of protection and mine, because we are one in power and we will give them physical immortality and moral incorruptibility forever and ever. I am the father together with the Holy Spirit. John 11, 23 to 27. John 11, 23 to 27. Notice faith in Christ, trusting in Christ, Believing in Christ, that's what saves you. The blood of Jesus is what gives you life. John taught it. Matthew teaches it. Mark teaches it. Luke teaches it. Now, John 11, 23 to 27. I love this. John 11, 23 to 27. I'm going to read it. I'm going to tell you a story. Jesus saith unto her, thy brother shall rise again. Martha, 
Her brother Lazarus, dead for four days, buried, his body starting to decompose. Martha saith unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. <clears throat> he that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Notice what he said, Pablo. He that believes in me. He that believes in me. Though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. If you are alive and you believe in me, my promise to you, you can never die. But then he says something interesting. Believest thou this? Do you believe this? See, that's the question. Jesus knows he's God. He knows he's reality. He doesn't need you <clears throat> to affirm who he is. But he wants you to affirm who he is for your blessing. He wants you to believe in him, not because he needs the accolades or the affirmation. He wants you to believe for your sake. So he's saying, Martha, do you believe this? And notice the response. She saith unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. Yes, I believe in you. And you said, if I believe in you, I can never die. And you will never die. Now let me... Let me share with you how the Lord used this to comfort my heart. Okay, you guys ready? And I pray it comforts your heart who have lost loved ones. Some of you have lost a loved one, whether a child or a parent or a spouse or a sibling. And Jesus says, those who've died in Christ, here is my promise to you. And if you read it, it's going to move me in the spirit, guys. It's going to move me in the spirit reading it. It says, when Martha heard that Jesus had come, she ran to him. You've got to start reading at John 11, 20, all the way down. But over, Orbiter, don't post it. Just, just I'm going to narrate it. She ran to him. She goes, Lord, had you been here, my brother would not have died. In tears, heartbroken. In tears, heartbroken. But then notice faith. This is faith from the Holy Spirit. Faith produced by the Holy Spirit. Though it seems like the world has ended for you. Though it seems like you're experiencing an impossible situation and you can't live another day, faith says in your heart, faith from the Spirit says it's not over. Because notice what she says in 22. Yet even now I know God will give you whatever you ask. My heart is broken because you could have been here before he died, Lord. You could have made it before he died and healed them. But you delayed and he's dead. And my heart is broken. I lost my brother, my best friend. But even now, even now, I know God will give you whatever you ask. I know who you are. You are the very heart of the Father, the very love of the Father. You are the Father's heart in the flesh. If love took on flesh, that's you because you are love in the flesh. And the Father loves you so much that even now, Jesus, if you ask for my brother to come to life, he'll give you what you want. <clears throat> and Jesus looked at her and said, your brother shall rise. And so Jesus is saying to every one of us, and these are the verses that ran in my mind and my heart. <clears throat> when they took the body of my mother, put in the casket, and lowered it to the ground. And the, the body of my mother. The woman who gave birth to me. <clears throat> that body. That carried me for nine months. The woman who gave birth to me. As they lowered her body down. The words of the master. Your mother shall rise again. Your mother shall rise again. I know at the last day, at the resurrection, she'll rise. And Jesus says to me, and he says to every one of you, to every one of you, he says this, those of you who lost a loved one, he says this, I am the resurrection 
and the life. He who believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And he who believes and lives shall never die. And so he says to every one of you, your brother is alive. Your mother is alive. Your father is alive. Your sister is alive. Your child is alive. <clears throat> Do you know why? Because those who've died in me, they're not did, dead. They live with me and shall rise again. Dahit Aziza Paul Lebain Matran Shimokyatan Kachakribit Minni. I've been seeing some posts, but I love you, brother. It's okay. Alach Jan Kalilibu. I even dealt with Deuteronomy 18, 9 and 14. That's easy. God bless you, right? You see what Jesus is saying? I love you too, Azizi. You see what Jesus is saying? If you believe in me, you can't die. Because I live, you live also. So I know right now, I know this and I believe this. My beautiful mother, she's with Jesus and the day will come. <clears throat> I, don't, I don't mean to cry, folks, but again. The day will come where I will see her face again. The day will come when I see the, the, the face of my Lord Jesus first and kiss his feet. And by his blood, I enter his presence. By his blood, not by my efforts. And I know the Lord will say, Sam, there's someone here who wants to see you. Yes, Lord. He's going to say to me, behold your mother. And he'll look at my mother and say, Helena. That was my mother's name. <clears throat> Helena, behold your son. And when I see her again, I will say to her, I'm going to say it in my Jilu language and I'll translate. Because of Jesus. Because of Jesus. Because he left the tomb empty. Because he's alive. Because he can never die. We will see them again. Okay? Praise his name. Amen? Praise his name. Is, aren't you thankful that Jesus came into the world? Aren't you thankful that Jesus entered this world born from a blessed virgin? From a womb set apart by the Spirit to become man. So that he could die and then leave the tomb empty, proving death is not the end. Death is not the end of you. It's a beginning of an everlasting relationship with me. But do you believe this? And we say, yes, Lord. Lord Jesus, yes. We believe this. We know you are God, the Son of God, our Savior. You are our hope, our love, our life. We love you, Son of God. Right? Anyway. There's a few more verses in John, and this will be it for today's session, right? Let's look at the rest of the verses where it says, By faith, believing in Christ, trusting in Christ. Yeah, I can see you, bro. Protestant believer, I can see you. All right? Ready? How can you not be in love with Jesus? And guys, if you believe Christ has called me for ministry, if you guys believe that God has called me to teach his word, keep praying God saves me, protects me and my children, and provide for us. Satan's not going to win. We've won because of the blood of Christ. Okay. A few more verses and we're done. A few more verses when we're done. This I got to read. Okay. We read 11, 23, 27. John 14, verses 1 to 6. John 14, verses 1 to 6. And then I'm going to do a part two to this one. Yep. John 14, verse 1 to 6. I love this passage. 
I don't know what Emax said that you banned him. Were you attacking me, Emax? Emax, whatever. Emajic, whatever. John 14, 1 6. <clears throat> Jehovah John, I mean, John 14 verses 1 to 6. <clears throat> Were you swearing at me? What happened? You got angry? It's okay, Akhwani. We can agree to disagree. So that's fine. I'm just trying to be as honest as scripture as I understand it. So you can disagree with me. It's okay, Akhwani. That's fine. John 14 verses 1 to 6. Let's read. Okay. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mentions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. Notice his promise. Guys, meditate on his promise. Fall in love with him. You can't love him enough. In my Father's house are many mentions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, notice his promise. I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there ye may be also. There you may be also. Here's this promise. I'm coming to bring you to me. See, I came for your mom, Sam. I came and I brought her to me and she's with me. And the day will come, I will come for you and unite her and unite you with her. And whether I go, you know, and the way you know. Now notice what, what Thomas says. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whether thou goest. We don't know where you're going. We don't understand what you're saying. And how can we know the way? And here's these powerful words. Notice what he says. I am the way, Thomas, the truth and the life. Have you, have you not known me? No man cometh unto the Father but by me. John 14, 18 to 19. John 14, 18 to 19. John 14, 18 to 19. Amen. He is my God. He is my Lord. <clears throat> John 14, 18 to 19. I will not leave you comfortless. Folks, read these promises. I will not leave you orphans. I will not leave you fatherless. You who've been raised without parents, Jesus says, I won't leave you fatherless. You who've been abandoned by family and friends, Jesus says, I will not leave you comfortless. Notice what he says. I will come to you. He, he promised. He can't lie. He's the truth. Believe him. Believe him. Believe him. He can't lie. And I'm a testimony. I'm a testimony. He has never left me. He's come to me over and over and over again. And then verse 19. Yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more. <laughs> but ye see me, and here's why. Because I live, you shall live also. Believe him. Believe him. He can't lie. Right? Now let me end it with the best news of all. Folks, let me end it with the best news of all. I want to give you two things. Do you know because of Jesus living in you? God the Father loves you and adores you as much as he loves Jesus. And number two, do you know that Jesus says you will dwell exactly where he dwells? And he dwells in the bosom in the heart of the Father. So that means because of Jesus, you will dwell in the heart of the Father, in the very bosom of the Father because of Jesus. Let me prove it to you. Are you ready for the proof? The Father loves you just as much as Jesus because Jesus lives in you. John 17, 23. John 17, 23. John 17, 23. Yep, here. Here's the proof. Never. They won't debate me. I in them. He's praying to the Father. I, Father, in them, all who will believe. And thou, Father, in me. I'm in them. You're in me. Guess what, folks? If the Father's in Jesus and Jesus is in you, that means the Father's in you because Jesus now connects you to the Father. You're in me, Father. They're in me. Guess what? In me, Father and us meet. In me, the Father and all of us meet. Because the, he's in me and you in me, you meet in me. 
you connect in me, right? I in them and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one. Now watch here, that the world may know that thou has sent me and has loved them as thou has loved me. Wow. Let's read 23 again. Let it sink in. Holy Spirit, make it penetrate our hearts. 23. Watch here. One more time. That the world may know that thou hast sent me and thou love them. You have loved them as you have loved me. Wow. You got to be on your face crying. Thank you, Jesus. Your request and prayer, Father, love them just like you love me. And the Father says, yes, my son. I love them just as much as I love you because you live in them. And the heart that you live in, the heart that's your throne, how can I not love and adore because my son lives in that heart? How can I hate the heart that contains my son? <clears throat> Any heart that my son lives in, any heart that says, welcome, son of God, my heart is your home, your throne. I absolutely love and adore that heart because I absolutely love and adore my son. Now, where, we, where are we going to live? John 17, 24. John 17, 24. And yes, it's a true story. This is real history. He really prayed that prayer. He really walked this earth and he's really alive. Folks, laugh at death. Look at death and say, death, you have no power over me. And I do not fear you because my Jesus has conquered you and he lives. And because he lives, I live as well. John 17, 24. Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me. I desire, Father, that those you've given me be with me where I am. Not beneath me, with me, next to me, where I am. Why? That they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me. For thou loves, loved me, you have loved me before the creation of the world. Did you catch what Jesus said? They will be with me, Father. That's what I want, and you give me everything I want. With me, where I am. But Jesus, where are you? Where are you, Jesus? John 1.18. John 118. John 118, and we're done. John 118. Watch here, and we're done. Where are you, Jesus? Where do you dwell? Where do you reside? No man has seen God at any time, the only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father. The very bosom of the Father. He hath declared him. If Jesus is in the bosom of the Father, and Jesus says, "Be, they will be with me where I'm at, guess what, folks? We will all reside in the bosom, in the heart, in the love of the Father because of Jesus. So you have to say, thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for this un- Speakable, meaning beyond the ability for us to even articulate unsearchable love. I love you. Father, Lord Jesus, I love you. Holy Spirit, I love you. This is a love you can't earn and can never repay. And Jesus says, I'm not asking you to earn it. Nor am I asking you to repay it. I'm asking you to receive it. Will you believe in me and receive it? You can't earn it, and you'll never be able to repay me. So all I'm asking is, will you receive it? Will you believe in me? Will you open your heart and say, Lord Jesus, my heart is your home. My heart is your throne. Sit on the throne of my heart. I love you. So now you see that's not the gospel. That's wrong to say that 
the apostles did not know that they're redeemed by the blood of Jesus through faith in Christ until Paul. That's wrong. And I hope this session by the power of the Holy Spirit made you fall more passionately in love with Jesus Christ. Lord willing, I'll be back Monday. I can't do tomorrow. I'll be back Monday. So hold your questions to then write it. Do me a favor. Hit the like button. Subscribe. And please pass this session on to others. Pass this session on to others. And ask the Holy Spirit to continue to help me grow. Crucify my flesh. Save me from my flesh. From anger. From impatience from fears, doubts, from lust, and fill me with the fruit of the Spirit, the life of the Spirit, love from the Spirit, the power, wisdom, knowledge, understanding of the Spirit to fight for my children, to protect us financially, provide for me to do ministry, and for that godly comp companion, that godly companion that will share life with me in glorifying Jesus. And the Lord show me if I found her, right? Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Jesus Christ is Yahovah to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus, we love you. Thank you, folks. Love you. See you Monday, God willing. Subscribe and look for the announcement on my social media pages. We love you, Jesus. Hallelujah.